child. Hello, hello, hello. What's up, everyone? There's so many things happening right now. At some point, we're going to need a producer to handle all of this. We have uh, a live Twitter spaces happening right now. So hello and shout out to everyone. If you're hanging with us on the Twitter spaces, we can see that. Let's see. Let's go to this view. Uh, and we can share. Oh, I think I just turned the phone off. There it is. So we can see a few people. What's up? Shout out to Zach in the background and Omar there. I'm sure we'll get a few more people joining. If you're in the YouTube chat, feel free to say hello. I see Dustin popping in there. Hello. Uh, you all can jump in and request to join. We've also got uh, Aiva hanging with us kind of in the background of the video here. And so in the description of this video, if you're watching right now, this is like a multimedia experiment here. We've got YouTube going, we've got uh, Twitter spaces happening in the background. You're going to be able to join the conversation. We're going to run through. We've got some visuals here, but we wanted to experiment with bringing this conversation into different spaces. So the Twitter folks can hear Colleen. Let's do a sound check on Colleen. Give us a Twitter space uh, heart or something like that if you can hear Colleen. Hey, thanks for everyone for joining. And, and supporting us with with yet another multimedia experiment. Yeah. <laughs> and Kevin's here saying, excited to find my first client. There we go. <laughs> nice pun. Okay, so let's do this. Let's go to finding your first client. A little presentation here. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so if you're watching, we will have a little slide presentation. Don't worry, we're going to talk about everything that's on screen, so you're not going to really miss too much. And the conversation today is going to be just that. Uh, conversation about finding your client, kind of getting started in this space. And if you're interested, we'd love to invite you up to join the conversation. So if you're, again, listening on Twitter Spaces, you can join the conversation and that will be up on the uh, YouTube stream, but we're going to have some visuals. So um, there's also a link, I think, here. I'm not sure how that works. I think there's like a way to pin in the YouTube chat. I don't know how. Let's see. There's a way somehow to like pin the replies to like a, a scoreboard. Colleen, we're gonna have to figure out how to like co-host these conversations. But anyway, let's uh, so, that, so that somebody else can moderate the Twitter space. Let's go through upcoming events because there's a lot of cool stuff coming up in the Webflow community. Again, if you're just listening, uh, you can find all these links at stateofflow.io. So if you wanna go to the website, you can see a feed of all of these. If you're watching on YouTube, we're gonna go to that website right now and just kind of take a look at upcoming events. We got the Salon de Refuse, which is coming up right now. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Um, but this is uh, an initiative by... Um, Hillary Kluwit. Hillary, yeah, Hillary. She does the UX designer talks. Yeah. And Carmia has uh, helped with the, I'm not quite sure, I think the branding aspect of it. And Maggie, who I can't pronounce Maggie's last name, Eastwood, Eastwood Studio, who's part of the No Code North, uh, she's done a lot of the design on this. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's see, watch live. Can we drop in on this? Is there, is it happening right now? Let's see. We can. Uh, UX designers. And so to have a developer talk about developer relations, uh, you know, there's a lot of UX designers who are now dabbling with development, especially with some of those really cool tools that are out there that make it a lot easier, those no code tools. So I think it's just going to be amazing to uh, to hear. Your so experience. that's happening right now live on LinkedIn. That's super cool to see that going down. Over there, let's see what else is coming up and interesting. Oh, the Reloom Design League. Uh, those are coming up today and Thursday. Those have been a lot of fun. We've got Angelo versus Grace coming up today and then Tommy versus Dan. Uh, Thursday, I'll be co-hosting that stream today. Those were a lot of fun. And then I'm not sure who's hosting the streams on Thursday, but just show up there, blast. Uh, Nor Northern Showcase, Keith Armstrong's gonna be on that. I think that's Friday, the no code, just, um, just meet up, no code, just meet up. This is uh, in the Dominican Republic, Colleen? I believe so, yes, yes. So just a recent addition. So that's an in-person event. So if you were in the area, um, or if you if you if your network is in that area for either this or it's the not inaugural Webflow PNW meetup this weekend, um, you know, help them help them spread the word about these about these events. Um, so Emmett Armstrong, Kevin, and I think Kevin is here in the chat, and uh, Tony Seats are organizing this, and it's a two day event. Nice. Both Friday and Saturday. So they're they're starting off with a bang. Nice. Not just a little event, but a two-day. <laughs> Good for them. I love to see this. We're seeing so many of these events pop up. Uh, Friend Back Cafe is also happening next week. We've also got the Global Open House. Uh, Flow London is coming up. That's going to be a, a cool event. That's a couple of days after the Open House. Creative South is coming up a few days after that. The Awards Conference in Toronto. Oh, my goodness. So many things coming up. But today we're talking about how to land your freelance first freelance client. So... Um, 
I wanted to, oh, I guess we did have them. We mentioned the Global Open House. That's enough. Go to um, stateofflow.io forward slash open house to learn more about the upcoming open house on March 21st. We do have confirmation from Vlad, FYI. So if you're listening <laughs> as a sneak peek, Vlad Magdalene will be there as a guest speaker for our opening panel. And we are talking to a few other people who we think will um, make that a really interesting event. So open house, March 21st. Now we're going to jump into finding your first client. So lots of people are kind of jumping into this world right now. Uh, I'm watching on the Twitter spaces right now. If anybody would like to jump in and share their first client story or advice they might have, basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through a little bit about how I found my first client and then we're going to open it up to conversation. So feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments here. Again, folks are watching live on YouTube. And we also have some folks in the Twitter chat. And hopefully as we go, this will spark some thoughts, some conversation. Hopefully some of you will feel comfortable enough to jump in and share a story about your first client. Um, tips, tricks of the trade, anything you might have found along the way. Uh, that we can pass on to other folks because there's so many people that are making this leap right now and jumping into this world of freelancing and web design, et cetera. Um, so let's do this. All right. So uh, setting the stage, this is a very similar time. Actually, we're going back to 2009, 2010. Um, actually, maybe it was later than that. I think it was like 2012 because 2009 is kind of when everything fell apart, the economy, blah, 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 whatever. And I was reinventing myself. I didn't want to go back into corporate sales career. And so like maybe many of you, I was like, I'm going to try this freelancing thing. I'm going to explore what my creative skill set can do on the internet. But I didn't know how to do any of these things yet. Right. I had, um, really just started tinkering with the web. Social media was kind of new, even in that early sense. Um, and so I didn't want to get into the, into any of that, but the only thing I knew how to do at the time was sales. And so I just thought I'm going to go door to door and start selling uh, text marketing was this little tool that I found. And along the way, I bumped into this guy and he was part of a big chamber of commerce and he knew I did a little bit of graphic design work. He traded me an, an infographic for a membership to this chamber of commerce. They were doing a, a membership sale. He didn't really want to give me cash. He's kind of like a cheap guy, you know, but I had also been a part of the Chamber of Commerce before and I knew that it was a very valuable business network. And so I figured, OK, this gets me into a bunch of networking events. This gets me, you know, into the community in a way that maybe just a couple bucks wouldn't. I think it was like 350 bucks is what I quoted for this infographic at the time. So anyway, I do this work for him. It's not a great infographic. I mean, at the time, I think I designed it on like Photoshop 3 not CS anything, like just Photoshop 3. Um, and so it was pretty basic, but it got me this Chamber of Commerce membership, and I started going diligently to these Chamber events. And at one of these networking events, I met a guy. His name is Bobby, company not to be named. We started kicking it off, you know, found a lot in common. And he let me compete. He let me bid on a branding project, web design, and logo redesign that they were working on. And... I had no idea what I was doing at the time, but I figured I knew how to do these things. I had some experience with the computer and with design work, and I was like, screw it, let's go get this. And over the course of building a little bit of relationship with the guy, he, uh, I think, probably liked my approach more than he liked my skill set because I didn't really have a portfolio at the time. I didn't have anything to back up the claims I was making. I just kind of was charismatic and trustworthy, and we just built a strong relationship as an individual. And that led to landing the deal. This was a website as well as a brand identity for like almost $10,000, just shy of $10,000. Um, and I had less than $10 in my bank account at the time. So I was flat broke. I was staying for free with a friend in his condo, right? So I'm like mooching an apartment at the time. Um, long story about how I ended up kind of... Uh, not on my feet at this moment in my life, but that's for another uh, podcast or live stream. I'm happy to get into any of that or as deep as anybody wants to go, but I didn't have any money in my bank account at the time is really the point. And I almost missed this meeting with this guy um, to pick up the check. So basically throughout the process and we can dive into that process. I just kind of want to lay the, the foundation here. So I, I convinced the guy that I'm the one that he needs to hire for his deal. He's super punctual. I woke up at 745 for an eight o'clock meeting with this guy in the morning. And I lived at least 15 minutes away on a, on a good day. Um, and so I'm like in the cartoon scrambling to get dressed on the way out the door to meet this guy because I know he's a stickler for punctuality. 
and I get to his office like three minutes after eight. Um, called him on the way. I said, oh, traffic's a mess, whatever. He made me sit in his lobby for an hour before he gave me this check. I thought I blew the deal. I'm freaking out because, again, I only have a couple bucks in my bank account at this time. I'm living for free with a friend of mine, and it was just not not great. Um, and anyway, I land the deal. He goes through with it, gives me the money. Um, again, he hired me to build a website and do graphic design for him. I ended up hiring somebody who thought they could do the website, ended up they couldn't do the website, and that's how I learned how to build websites. And so that's kind of how I got into this freelance world. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just very ambitious, and I was just talking to everyone that I could in that moment about things that I knew I could do and skills and services I could offer. The internet selling online was not as prolific as it is now. Um, social media was just kind of in its early infancy. WordPress was in its early infancy. Like a lot of these things, you know, so it's a little different than it is now. I don't know how to draw exact parallels, but I'd love to kind of maybe jump in with, I know Colleen's back there. I know Ava's back there. Anyone on the Twitter spaces, feel free to jump in um, or even share your thoughts in the comments. I know we have some people here. What's up, Joel, in the comments saying, hi, everyone. Fitter Media saying, nice rhyme, Mar. And then Jay, what's up? I uh, love the experience stories. So that story, I mean, it goes deep because this is what taught me a couple of things. Resilience, I was just like kind of figuring out what I was doing. The first six months before I landed my first client were kind of, I was kind of shooting blanks. I was trying to sell this text marketing door to door. That wasn't working because what I found out is that people didn't really want text marketing. They wanted integrated marketing. Maybe they wanted text marketing, but they wanted integrated with their plan. And that's where I started learning about web design and other services and graphic design and branding. And I just learned how to like speak the language, right? So I think first takeaway here is, you know, landing your first client is learning how to immerse yourself in an industry and then learning how to speak the language. I don't know if, you know, anybody can relate to that. But I also have friends who don't necessarily speak the language of the thing they're trying to do. And I communicate with them on like on a regular basis, like, hey, I think this is holding you back. Right. I, I got a literally the guy that lives next to me. Hope he's not watching me. Um, <laughs> hope he's not watching the stream today. Hello. Um, but often talks about wanting to get into some of the software stuff and is building a piece of software, but doesn't take the time to really understand the language of the people who are doing the software thing right now, building SaaS products, selling SaaS products, et cetera, the language they're speaking. And so I'd say the first step kind of as a takeaway, the thing from my story that helped me the most is I just, I'm a good chameleon, right? And I studied and I got into it and I learned the lingo. And even though I didn't have the portfolio, the presentation I made for them was beautiful. I had their brand on billboards. I kind of like I oversold a little bit of like their potential, you know, it was like a, a copy machine sales company and you know, they're not very tech forward. They're not very modern. And so like I kind of oversold their possibility and made them look good even before I sold the project. So, um, immersing yourself in, and I have a bunch of notes here. I'm wondering if anybody, um, Colleen or, uh, Aiva, have any thoughts about the story there? If they want, if you want to share anything on your first stuff before we get into anything, deeper on the, the visuals or really anything right now? I think I'm more, a little bit, I think, you know, Reimar and I talked a little bit before before this this, this stream as we kind of typically do for, for these things. And I think there's pieces that are a little bit later where I feel like I have maybe more to, to offer. So I don't want to totally jump the, the gun unless you want to start to getting into to niches. And that does have something to do with Understanding the lingo and knowing knowing the lingo, yeah, of the place that you're getting into, or somebody else on Twitter Spaces or here on the live stream chat. Yeah, don't be shy on the Twitter go. Spaces. The reason we're hosting the Twitter Spaces here is so that you all can um, jump in and get involved in the conversation. I'd love to know what your um, first <laughs> he was pointing <laughs> at the screen. If you're watching, um, what your first freelance client experience was like. Um, I've got some tips and tips that we can kind of go into um, about how to attract clients. So I do have some notes that we can jump into uh, here next. Aiva, I'm going to bring you into a different spot here, actually. Um, any thoughts, Aiva, on your side about first clients? I know you're like, you know, you're jumping into some of this SEO stuff. Like what's 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 what say you as far as it relates to landing clients? I would just say if this is the beginning of your journey, value 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 and it's not gonna be raining money or anything just value just be helpful be friendly value 
provide value, create value, ask what they need, try to, to do it. If you know you're learning, just say, hey, I'm learning. I'm going to do it for free or whatever. And gradually, it kind of starts spiraling out of control. And then sooner than you know, it's going to be, I don't know, I don't have that many hours in a day to cover everybody's needs. And then that's when you raise prices. So I think that's that's hard. I know I've been in those shoes years ago. It's hard pill to swallow but i think that's how everybody started right yeah nice so we just got yeah i do agree i think that's kind of it right you gotta just you gotta just do it <laughs> you gotta kind of start we're gonna go through how to attract some clients i see um Jaredin, is that your name just jumped in on twitter spaces you got some thoughts about your first client Hello, Jaredin. Oh, I'm not seeing any sound coming from. Oh, there it goes. You can hear me now? There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, maybe a little less about my very first client, but certainly how I have like maintained and continued to attract people is uh, definitely through the use of uh, either Loom or some other screen recording service because you know, putting a human face to what you are saying and doing for somebody else, you know, immediately helps build trust. And that's, that's really the, the, one of the harder hurdles to get over, at least initially is to like, you know, maybe you're cold emailing somebody or. Oh, no. In your face, it can be very hard for them to like open up that message and then maybe continue on with whatever it is you're saying, you know, Hey, come let me build you a website or something, right? So instead of that, uh, using a video has been tremendous and just being comfortable on video and, mm. you know, showing your face and then explaining what, what kind of value you can provide to people. I think that's that's huge. And then the second thing would just be to kind of have some kind of standard operating procedures for communication. You know, think about how you're going to talk to somebody before you message them, how you're going to talk to them while, you know, during the client uh a relationship and then how you're going to talk to them once the project is finished have you considered those three um sections of how you communicate with people and so you know as designers it's like look you can design anything you can design relationships right so apply some of the, those um incredible design skills to your communication and i think that's that's going to provide a, like a nice soft set of skills for any projects you tackle with any new clients Dang, those were so good. I'm over here. Um, I just started taking notes, but after you were talking, we got to get better, <laughs> Colleen, at, at documenting some of this. But I like that, uh, how you finish with designing the experience, because I think a lot of times we forget about that, like that end user experience. We focus a lot on like, oh, we're going to get paid and I'm going to land my first client. And the, the, the idea is that you're getting something out of it. But what are you giving that person back? Because that's where you really make the money is like delivering the value once somebody like gives you money. Like once somebody gives you money, what's that experience like for them? That's that's the biggest thing, I think. Right, Jaredin? That's huge. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. And you'll know this too if you have paid anybody another contractor for any work that you know you have them do for you right how do they communicate with you you know exactly what like a stellar contractor feels like so just be that for your clients mm. i like that so um you know and we should have the twitter recording after twitter space recording after this too yeah so and don't... it'll be on youtube so we're gonna be everywhere there's lots of people <laughs> This is kind of hi, cool. YouTube. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hi, YouTube. That's right. The Twitter folks speaking to YouTube right now. I'm trying to get some Twitter folks in the or some YouTube folks in the comments, maybe sharing your thoughts. Feel free to leave your thoughts. Thoughts. <laughs> yeah, um, Jared, and any, anything else you want to share? And anybody else, feel free to jump in on the Twitter space. Um, we can have up to 10 speakers here. So feel free to share your thoughts. We're talking about what, um, how to attract clients. So I've just started another note. Um, you know what is good. So build something good for the end user. I think that's a good abbreviation there um, about what some of yeah, Jared was saying. Good. Yeah. Any, any, any other like um, little tidbits you want to put in these notes? And maybe what we can do is we'll add these to the um, YouTube description. And then again, anyone else, feel free just listening w on the system idea sure maybe just like go ahead one last thing about like 
yeah, one last thing about um, just keep going. You know, you you don't know where you're going to find a client. You never know. And I know, like some people, like myself, I I am not a popular person, and you know, I don't have thousands of followers. My network on Facebook is very small. I like to keep it close to the chest. But you know, I found found clients within like groups of like a hundred people. You know, I, I found people who needed a web service and they, they knew me and they trusted me. And so that's how that kind of turned out. Right. But it's like, you know, you just make connections with people, be serendipitous. Don't, don't limit yourself to only cold emailing or only, you know, reaching out on LinkedIn. And those are fantastic resources, but, you know, just be, keep an open mind as to where a client could come from because it's not always going to be online. Right. Don't ever forget the human element of just going up and, you know, looking at, you know, people, you know, in real life, go look at their websites if they don't have one and, and tell them, you know, Hey, I'll, I'll make you something for free. Just let me use it in my portfolio. There's, there's tons of opportunity out there, but it really does take, um, you know, your own personal motivation to get there. But yeah, yeah just keep going. <laughs> I really like that. Um, Colleen, what are you thinking? Well, I just, to, to kind of build on that, I'm just kind of reminded of one of the projects that I was really proud about that kind of ties into some of this. So there was a local group that I was a part of that the site, the website was atrocious and it was like nails on a chalkboard for me. And I was part of the communications communi communications committee and would just kind of say things here and there, but, but the group was not necessarily technically inclined and for a number of reasons really didn't want to upset the apple cart with who their current website vendor and such was uh, until I started this was a WordPress site discovering that there were some major security vulnerabilities and the site had already been hacked a couple of times. And so, you know, was able to start to pitch that I take over the site on as, as, as kind of peeling the onion on, on, on some of these things. I'd already established trust with the group because I'd already been um, part of the committee one of the committees and as part of that ended up spending a lot of time with the membership and finance person and discovering all these things that were super manual in terms of what they were doing. And to go back to the comments that were just made about thinking about the experience, me as a volunteer, as, as a group, I don't want, I wouldn't want to be doing like these 50 mundane tasks. And that was in introducing a lot of errors because it wasn't, they didn't have fail safes and guardrails that were in place. So ended up kind of expanding the project. I mean, this is getting a, getting a little bit long, but at the end of it, one of the things that really struck me was that the finance person basically said, because of what I put in place, what had been taking him basically 45 minutes, he was able to now do in two minutes. Mm. And that was like wildfire, both that was great for the group, but that also improved my reputation locally of all of a sudden this group now had a showcase site and there were individuals that were telling other people about what I had done for them. And it was all extremely, extremely niche. So again, not necessarily thousands of followers or any of that, but it was just that word of mouth and it was that reputation. And it was, I learned a lot from doing that. I had never done a membership site prior to that. So, you know, I had some things that I needed to learn along the way, but you know, just from there, the work, the things that I had done, that all just then became my, became a calling card. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, and that's it too. That's how you build a little bit of clout, a little bit of portfolio. That's how you build a little bit of experience. That's how, you know, you get like, um, you know, one success leads to the next, leads to the next. And that's really how, how this takes off. Right. Um, Dustin, uh, what's up, Dustin? I see he popped in on Twitter. You got anything to add to the um, how to attract clients? And then I got um, a list that I also want to go through. So um, Dustin, feel free to jump in and then we're going to jump into like a little list that I prepared ahead of time here. Yeah, 100 percent. Great. Uh, great hearing you again. Uh, great to be here and, and talk about this because I'm, I'm in my uh, second full year. So I, I went through this whole process of like how to find my own first client. So I, I figured it, I might be able to pass on some, some things that I learned. Um, it, you know, you, Ramar, you're great at sales and you had the experience. And so walking into a room at the chamber, I mean, you've got an energy that, um, that, you know, people attract to it, you know, 
And that might be tougher for some people to uh, either start developing those sales skills. Um, and, and so the way that I instilled trust right away, you know, it, cause I didn't have those sales skills was to just show up in person, um, was to do chamber events. I, I joined the BNI. I, uh, would solicit by knocking on doors and going into, you know, into businesses. Um, I just looked for, you know, I started learning WordPress at the time and I, I knew that I could help somebody. And so I just looked for some low hanging fruit in my area. I found some businesses that had good reviews. They looked like they'd been in business a while, but they were just really lacking on the website side of stuff. So I could show up and, and help out. And if I showed up and I truly believed that I could help them, like that was my sales. Like they could see that I was authentic and that I really thought that I could help them and that they were willing to trust me because I was local and, you know, I really believed that I could help them. And then I, I picked up, you know, a couple clients that way. And then I built up a portfolio and, you know, I just closed my first two clients that are just online mm. now, but it's only after, you know, hitting the streets. <laughs> that was, that was just my strategy. It was, it was what worked for me. Um, and then now I've built up the momentum and I have some processes and I've got a portfolio and, and things built from that. But it, you know, if anybody's looking for, their first client, I, I think that there's some low hanging fruit in their geographic area that, you know, they can look into. That's such, that's such good advice. And I want to like, um, I want to double down on that. Actually, I think that most people, as they start out, they see all of these like, high level, you know, people dealing with, you know, big clients and blah, blah, whatever, international this and, you know, $10,000 that when like reality is like, maybe the shop across the street has a couple thousand bucks to pay you for a website. And that'd be perfect for you. Who's just getting started building a website. It's low risk, you know, like it's, it's, uh, you know, that you're not going to break anything mission critical a lot of times for these smaller clients. Um, the barrier to entry to sell this product is going to be a, a little less difficult. So Dustin, I know like not a lot of people maybe have that experience and, and kudos to you for jumping out of um, your comfort zone to kind of get into that chamber situation. But that's that's one of my top tips, actually, is if you're looking to land your first client, maybe start swimming in the pools that have the type of fish you can eat, <laughs> you know, like don't compete against the, <laughs> yeah. the biggest agencies in the world. If you if you're trying to, like, just get started. Um, any, anything else you want to jump in on there, Dustin? Any thoughts? Finishing thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it may not be, it, it may be different for each location, but just in, in my area, like the Boston, Worcester, Providence area, all of the local web designers that I'm competing with now, it, it's like when you walk into a business owners, uh, when you walk into their office, they get bombarded with emails and LinkedIn DMS from other people that do the services that we provide. So showing up in person separates you but it also puts you into the people that are also local service providers for web design. And most of those people right now, and at least in my area are all WordPress. Mm. So you can show up with a really clean web flow template or something from the, like the maiden, you know, web flow clonables. And just, just from having that like technology arbitrage, just, I don't know, just kind of blow your local competition out the water too. Yeah. I think that's great advice. I mean, especially with the with the WordPress piece, at least in the area that I'm in, there's basically no one here who's really doing Webflow work. And just knowing a little bit about the competition who's doing WordPress, the amount that's being charged for basically nothing is in some ways just kind of mind blowing, but it's also a huge opportunity, at least for, around this area, it's a huge opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Good church. I Agreed 100%. Um, I want to give Joel's comments here a little bit of love. Uh, talking about Colleen, I can relate to your story. Play on your unfair advantage. Sometimes the unfair advantage isn't development or design. It could be accounting or processes. Um, he follows up. My two cents would be don't worry too much about cost for the first client. Use it as a learning experience. On the flip side, don't be afraid to increase prices as you go. And I think this leads into what we were talking about right after that, about swimming in the pool you know, with the fish that, that you can handle, right? Like, um, 
there's certain rods like when you start fishing like you, you the first rod you fish with isn't the rod you're going to use to go like offshore and catch the marlin with you know like you start out with like this little beginner rod and you know like you go catch a little guppy and this is exactly what joel's kind of saying here is like don't worry too much about the fish you catch the first time just learn how to catch fish and then once you learn how to catch fish then you can like figure out oh if i use this kind of bait i catch a different kind of fish if i you know like have this kind of rod or if i go into this location maybe then i can catch a different kind of fish or the fish are bigger when i you know throw my bait into this part of the water versus that part of the water and so i think you know joel that's a really good point is just learn how to catch the fish um and then you can figure out how to catch bigger fish um any any thoughts there from the the crowd and just because you were um, done speaking, you you have speaker privileges, so uh, feel free to raise your hand and jump back in if the conversation suits your fancy again as we go. Okay, I, go ahead, Colleen. I was just gonna say I agree with with Joel about that being a great analogy with the with the fishing rods. So I mean, it's just like that with anything with life. We 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 crawl before before we walk before we run. So yeah, you know, one step in front of one step from from front of the other, and if you try and do too many things all at once, you're kind of just setting yourself up for failure. So, you know, going with that smaller piece and then you're working on your invoicing and other aspects of your business and you're starting to get that little piece down, you can then take on that larger site. And then you're also leveling up, you know, customer support and following up. And, you know, maybe now you're able to go back and upsell to clients that you previously had done some work for because maybe you have new skill sets or something has changed or you've learned something about how you've got an additional value add potentially for their business or maybe they've grown and have new needs maybe they've outgrown what you've done for them yeah yeah and i like um i like what joel was saying earlier about the um wordpress versus webflow thing I want to go over to my list here because I have a list here, how to attract clients, advice from the crowd, and then how to attract clients. This is, let's adjust this advice from Ryan. <laughs> there we go. So that way we can distinguish the two sides here. But I really think like don't sleep on the value of that distinguishing thing and the local community, right? Um, actually starting a community, right? There's a reason why, there's a couple reasons first of all it's a great way to get involved in a low risk setting inviting a couple people and this could be online or in person okay there's great reasons for either way online or in person uh if you're just starting out it's a great way to get involved in a low risk setting and also meet with other people who might be kind of in the same space if you host a meetup about webflow development odds are somebody who's joined you is going to also be in that same level and so that's a great place for you to start talking and having conversations with other people who might be in that peer group um and to start building relationships in that type of setting, right? One-on-one -on -one settings, small group settings, that becomes really valuable uh, for a number of reasons, whether it's to share information, whether it's to strategize, whether it's to get feedback from an idea you're thinking about. There's a lot of reasons why kind of starting a community can be helpful in this process as a freelancer. Uh, two, start hosting events and attracting your tribe. This kind of follows in in the low risk setting because now you can start inviting other people who are similarly interested in doing some of this stuff. You see us doing that with this stream. You've seen us doing that with other ways throughout the years with the different events, with the different things that we do. It's all about trying to provide value back to the community as we grow. This, you know, I'm not out here trying to land web design clients anymore. But this does put you on the radar and this does attract the type of people that are looking to break into this community, to uh, interact with the community, to host events with the community, to do different things. And so just the as we attract more people, as we do more of this, it creates opportunities for people to stumble into us and it creates uh, more opportunity for collision. So as you're freelancing, as you're exploring, the more you get involved with these communities and do stuff like this, the, the, the more it can help you. It's also underrated for SEO, right? Your meetup page, your Eventbrite page, some of these things that are big networks. Think about like what a Yelp page is for a restaurant, right? You can have that same thing, especially when it, it relates to local Webflow search results by just starting a meetup page and getting some activity on the meetup site that is in your local region. Because for instance, when I first started out doing this, there was nobody in Web, uh, Sarasota doing Webflow. And I'm not sure if there is still, but if you type in Sarasota Webflow, you're gonna end up on our meetup group page right, as one of the top search results, which then is going to point you back to myself and Colleen and the other people that were involved. And you end up just 
again, more opportunities for collision. And it's a high ranking site. It's going to rank there faster than the new Webflow site you just built that you're trying to get Google to recognize to put you at the top of search results. And so it's an easy way to try to get something up to a higher search ranking position uh, in, a, in a short amount of time than you might be able to organically. And so that's a huge underrated benefit, especially going back to what Dustin was saying and what Colleen was saying about that local market, you know, like don't undersell the value that might be just in your local neighborhood, right? Within 50, 100 miles of where you live. Like that's an untapped potential. Um, it also places you at a subject matter expert, which is good for all the things we talked about. And it starts helping you create some accountability and camaraderie, right? It starts helping you create a little bit of, uh, again, going back to just getting other people around that are trying to do the same thing, having that ability to just bounce ideas off of these people and really get interactive with them. That's a big win. You know, having those types of people um, to, to share that experience with. Uh, Fitter Media is saying here, content and community is underrated. I agree. I don't know if it's going to stay underrated for long. It seems like the secret's out now with how people are starting to move into this next phase of marketing, et cetera. I'd be interested to know if anybody else from the community here, uh, any of those things that we talked about, starting community, if that'd be high on your list um, for or getting involved in community for finding your first client. Um, and I would actually say that you can spend a lot of time getting involved in community and never find a client. I want to put that as a caveat. You can distract yourself as much as you want with community. You can distract yourself with all of these events and all of these things, and you can feel like you're busy, and you can feel like you're talking about the industry chat, and you can feel like you're being productive, but maybe it doesn't lead you to that first client. And so I would also you know, like use you, uh, urge you to use kind of some caution as you get into doing this, that it doesn't just become that, right? It doesn't just become something you do as a distraction, as a thing to just pass the time or, or to feel like you're part of the space, but you're not actually getting towards your goals. Make sure that as you're building and growing community that you're, you know, you, you have some kind of target in mind and that the community you're building is kind of in service to landing those clients building those relationships, doing the things that you want to do. And it could be that community is not for you landing your first client, but that's what this episode's about. So just tying it back to that. Um, any any thoughts, Colleen, uh, Aiva, about any of that here? You know, there's that rule of thumb about, you know, you're kind of the average of the people that you spend time with. Mm. And so, you know, I think there that that a, accountability and camaraderie of having that mix that's helping not only you level up, but that's also helping others level up. And just going back a little bit, maybe to the fishing anal analogy, you're able to go with that one rod, and now you're able to level up. And the next thing you know, you're you're fishing for those marlin, yeah, and landing those whales. And also, I would add that like communicating with others and creating especially content and especially creating content at scale, but all these three also teaches you how to communicate better. So as you guys started with uh, knowing language, because it's easy for you sometimes to know what you're doing when you work, but it's really hard to explain for a new person who never heard about this industry, how, what, what words like, and that's the hard part. So that's why where I would see like content and communication with others, especially others from other industries or similar industries or the same industries, like always going to improve your ability to express yourself and defend your opinions and maybe even form uh, unifying or opposite opinions. That's all based, you know, on who you are. And this is like a, another part of learning experience outside of the, you know, like soft skill experience outside of the technical actual skill that you need. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much involved in not just finding the clients, but then, you know, keeping them happy and building on top of that. I, um, I mean, and then we can, we can compare notes here, I think to between the advice from the crowd and the, my advice, I think you'll start to see like stand out in your local market. There's an op overlap, get active in the community. That's an overlap, uh, find a specific niche. We talked about that a little bit, um, you know, and, and, I don't know that that was mentioned on this one, but it, it does start talking about designing that experience. The better you get at finding a specific audience that wants to buy your product or buy from you, um, the better you get at finding that specific niche or kind of like whittling your services or offering down to that specific person. And that's not to say that you can't be in a couple different niches, but just that 
you know, this is a good way to, you know, define the niche you might be interested in. Um, I wanted to show this, you know, this was uh, Dan Petty, I think, on Twitter the other day. Let's see if we can bring this audio You need in. to ask yourself when thinking about your portfolio. You're going to hear it over and over again. Only show the type of work you want to get. If you don't want to design logos or brochures, don't show them. It's a simple yet highly effective philosophy to follow. If you really want to do logos and branding, but all you show is web design, you're only going to get web design work. The same applies across the board for all industries, all the way down to your particular style. If you only want to do 3D illustration work, but frequently show... So he just kind of continues on this tear mm -hmm. here. And I think this is a, 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 a good just thing to think about too. As you're, you know, like when you're landing your first client, maybe this isn't as big a problem because you don't have a bunch of work to show people. But as you're going, you know, you want to start filtering the type of work that you show to match the type of work you want to land. I'm wondering if anybody who's listening in the Twitter chat right now has any thoughts on that specifically shaping your portfolio, kind of, you know, like targeting a specific type of client. Because I think so many people when they when they think about like landing my first client or whatever it is they're going to do, they they kind of I see themselves overwhelming the, the opportunity or the potential like in their head, it becomes this insurmountable thing because they think, oh, I have to go land a client that's going to pay me thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for a project, right? Whereas, you know, um, I'm going to go back to an example of, of somebody that I met early on in my video career because I had somebody that I was mentoring a little bit and they thought they were really good and they were super talented um, but they wanted like so much money for their videos. And then there was this other guy who was kind of starting up at the same time and he would do a, whatever video you wanted for 500 bucks. Literally didn't matter. The guy would just show up and do your video, 500 bucks. And he just took all of the video like business in town. And he would just show up on projects where you're like, damn, how are you competing? Um, and he didn't care. He didn't care about the money at the time. He was just like, I just want to like get experience doing these things. And it took them like six months, a year to figure this out. You know, some of those first videos were not great, but he landed video clients that you didn't think he'd be able to get or that you weren't sure like why they would, but it was just a pricing thing. And they didn't care if they got a little bit lesser quality video at that price point. And he started churning and churning and churning these videos out. Next thing you know, he's like one of the top wedding videographers in the area because he started just like really finding a style. He started figuring out that he didn't like some of these corporate jobs, that the wedding clients were more, you know, uh, in his wheelhouse. He started kind of understanding how wedding clients wanted to like um, deal with a videographer. And next thing you know, he's charging tens of thousands of dollars for wedding videography and getting it. And his Instagram is exploding and all of these things, you know, and it was just cool to see because there were so many people hating on him early on uh, that were just like, I don't understand why he's doing that. I can't believe he's selling it so cheap. I can't believe this, that, the other, like, don't worry about any of that shit, right? He was just learning how to fish. He was just out there getting the reps in. And then eventually he figured out how to find some bigger fish. He figured out better places to fish. He started learning better bait and techniques and all sorts of stuff. And it's off to the races from there. And so I think, you know, as you, as you're considering what actions to take as you're getting into yeah. this, because I'm imagining you're still thinking about that stuff. If you're listening at this point, you know, don't always think it's got to be about landing that big, you know, big whale right off the bat. Like you often aren't going to land a record breaking fish on your first time out fishing, you know? Um, but if you fish long enough, odds are you're going to start like figuring some shit out. So I think that's what it goes down to, you know, like showcasing that best work and then just getting better at shaping that story, learning, you know, go, let's go back to the advice, the designing the experiences, building the systems, keep going. Cause you never know where you're going to go. There was another point that kind of hit on that. It's like the audience doesn't have to be viral for you to be effective, right? You don't have to reach thousands and thousands or millions of people for the person that might be interested in buying your product to find you. I've landed deals, big deals from videos that got like dozens or, you know, small hundred, like low hundreds of views. Right. So I don't know. Um, any thoughts there? I, I see you, your brain, your, your wheels are spinning, Colleen, or no? 
Yeah, well, I was just reminded, I don't know, some, some of you may have heard this this um, story, but I, about a year or so ago, John Saunders, 5.4 Digital, was a guest at the Floxies community. And one of the things that he was talking about was he wanted to work with gaming related clients. And so this also touches on, I can't remember who made this point earlier in the conversation. I'm just kind of scanning chat and names that come to mind, but about clonables. And so part of what he did was put some clonables out there related to gaming and was able to attract uh, clients that that were in that niche. That was something he wanted to do. Uh, so, you know, that's that that Webflow showcase that made in Webflow really is truly a, a, a gold mine in so many ways of if you're trying to learn Webflow of going in and seeing what people are doing, breaking it down, seeing how they built it, inspiration, and then also for, for potentially for leads. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of that, um, one of the, it just reminded me of Jan's tweet yesterday, Jan Lesser's tweet yesterday, mm. and thinking about like building publicly here or like having other people build. We're gonna um, one of the reasons we wanted to experiment with this kind of format is to maybe start thinking about like uh, casual, like how casual can we make these things? How often can we spin one of these up? You'll notice that we just kind of spun this up quickly today uh, without a lot of notice about the Twitter space. Um, and so just experimenting, I know uh, there was a tweet from Jan Losert yesterday or the day before talking about um, just wanting to watch people build and work. And we've been experimenting with like a live, uh, kind of like a live room. That's kind of some of this, right? Where people can talk, people can hang out. Um, I see Zach and Harshit just accepted the invite. I started sending out some invites to chat. But let's look at this comment real quick. Fitter Media saying, outbound sales via cold email or LinkedIn DMs is an amazing way for finding a first client as well. We've hired Webflow freelancers and designers who approached us this way. Interesting. Um, and these are the kind of conversations we want to spark. So if you're tuning in now, be sure to follow. Go check us out on State of Flow um, YouTube channel. And here on Twitter, we, we don't have a home because our account got <laughs> blocked, but maybe soon. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. What, what say you all to the cold um, to the cold outreach? And then we'll bring uh, Zach and, and Harshit into the conversation. Um or maybe you got thoughts on any of that, Zach or Harshit. I'll actually leave it to you. Do you guys have any thoughts on uh, cold outreach? Uh, let's see, Joel Whitaker saying, if you're not an extrovert, find clients who are. If you do good work, they'll usually uh, bring you more work through friends and business associates. Yes. Referrals. How to find cl clients is referrals. Harshit, what you got to say? Hey, Ramar. Ho hope you guys are being well. Hello, everyone. This is Harshit. Uh, am I audible, Ramar? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Nice, nice. So, uh, yeah, so about cold emails, uh, I personally, you know, for, for me, it never worked. I tried it initially, but it never worked for me. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of think about this in a way that a lot of times I also receive a lot of cold emails uh, in my email box from other companies. Like I want to audit your website. I want to work as a SEO thing. You know, I want to do SEO and all those things. So I personally don't like it. And I, I think most of the people will not actually like it nowadays. Nowadays, as you know, you can actually go in a, go in a platform and find uh, someone that you know better or you can do your own research. So you will not prefer someone who is actually messaging you on email and then you are going to take a test or make maybe an interview and then you are approving them. So I think personally, cold email uh, never worked for me. But I, I know uh, personally to really amazing tricks you know you can use uh, when you are in your starting days to find your first client and uh, two of them are one of them are one of them is actually using freelancing platforms again i'm saying this only for the beginning for starting i think freelancing platforms are good so what i personally did is i used fiverr okay so because these platforms work on an algorithm right so if you are if you are getting more attention or uh, uh, maybe if you are having more ratings if you have five to six clients there then uh, it will automatically drive clients to you. It will automatically drive traffic to you. Now, those initial five to four, four to five clients that you need to go, get on those freelancing platforms, you can actually tell your friends and family members to go and uh, maybe you can do some work for them as well. Or you can ask your friend for a favor. You can ask them to leave some uh, reviews and rating about your personal work there as well. So now what will happen once there are four to five reviews on your Fiverr profile or Upwork profile, the platform will start promoting your uh, profile as well. So now you will actually start getting messages from, from there. So this one actually worked for me. This is how I got my first client. And it was like maybe two or three months gap. That's it. So in two months, I was, uh, you know, 
I was having good amount of clients from fiber. The second method that I think uh, I should have done, and uh, now it's actually much better, is actually, uh, okay, in all of the cases, I am assuming that uh, the skills are smooth and out already. So I know how to use Webflow. In that case, only this method will work as well. So now, because I know how to use Webflow and uh, any other platform that I want to use, so what I will do, I will connect with the community, as you said, and I will reach out to freelancers or agencies who is working on the community because a lot of times they have a lot of load that they don't know how to take care of uh, when i was also in flow chef i used to have a lot of leads that i used to transfer so I, I actually used to wait for a lot of freelancers to just contact me hey contact me and he will they will say hey harshit do you have any work for me i will check their work i will check uh, their skills and whenever i have an extra project i will give to them so definitely uh, with community building connections it good but you can definitely reach out to agencies and freelancers and tell them hey please refer your extra work to me this is my work quality now they know that you are actually working good and your skills are great so they will definitely refer your client to you so yeah these two tricks i think definitely worth it uh, worth trying and should definitely work for to find your first client yeah, that's really good. Um, I, I really appreciate you sharing those thoughts. I wonder if you could answer this question from Akansha uh, on YouTube, who's saying, as a beginner, how do we assure the client that we can do their job? Um, and I know, like, maybe some of those platforms, Upwork and Fiverr, you know, are useful kind of to start out, but maybe you don't have, um, you know, work to showcase or you don't have, like, reviews on any of those sites yet. Harshit, how, how, how would you help them, you know, kind of understand that they can assure the client or how, how, how do you help them kind of build that early level trust? Uh, definitely, Remar. So I think, uh, you know, in initial levels, we should be really care, uh, careful about what we are taking as a scope of project. Okay, so for example, I have a Webflow project where client is requesting uh, five type of integrations, development and design as well. So I should be really careful what I know 100%, okay, or what I'm actually very good at. So I will only provide that service or I will only, because when I will talk with my client, okay, uh, I will be confident about it. I, I will be able to answer their questions because generally when we meet, they will ask us questions. Hey, I'm facing this problem. I have this scope and all. So uh, we just have to answer them very confidently and only provide service in the beginning that you are confident about. So if you will be confident about yourself and uh, what you are actually going to deliver to them, it will actually build the trust on the client as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, for initials, only work on the things that you actually know how to do it, okay? Yeah. I think this is what I will do, yeah, yeah. as a beginner. And I think this is, um, this is something I have on my notes as a final thing to think about, is you gotta be ambitious, but you gotta be careful what you promise the client. And then you have to know the limitations of your skill set as well as the limitations of the tool or the platform you're using because those are the things that will get you in the most trouble is over promising something to a client or um, going back to Akansha's comment here, you know, like telling a client, like building some assurance, you know, and then you can't deliver the goods or you found yourself stumped or, um, you know, like kind of out of your depth from a technical standpoint, this can be a real good way to just, you, you know, handicap yourself from the beginning uh, as it relates to your freelance career. So, um, and then I think finding a network of people who will help you, this keeps coming back up. Harshit mentioned it. A couple other people have mentioned it before. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is making sure you build those relationships before you need the help. It's hard to like be scrambling on a project and need, you know, someone to come and bail you out or to help you do something or to figure something out. And you need it like immediately, five minutes ago, or the, the project is launching today at noon and you need this thing yesterday. Um, you know, like you can get those things done if you have the right network in place, but it's a lot harder to do if that network's not in place when you need that. And so you have to, that's why getting involved in the community, that's why going back to like some of the stuff we were talking about before is really um, smart because this is what helps you build those relationships so that when you need to reach out or you find yourself in a pinch, you have a little bit of network to, to do some of that. Yeah, I, th I think I saw a tweet this morning, actually, just crediting like the Floxies community that somebody was in a pickle with, with something that was about to launch and they were stuck. And I don't know who in the community, but basically Floxies was getting credit for being there to, to help them help them out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things this community is so good about 
And a lot of these creator communities are, especially the Webflow community, is about being there to help other folks. You know, there's a ton of Slack channels. There's a ton of different people. I mean, every day of the week, there's something going on. You can go and check out all those events at stateofflow.io uh, to see what's coming up. But there's all sorts of things happening in the community that, you know, and people are so helpful that literally you can reach out to anyone in this space and they will almost always help you if they can. Um, people are accessible, they're available, they're so willing to help. And I think that's, you know, but you again, if they have some kind of relationship with you, <laughs> they're not going to just bend over backwards and help you uh, if it's the first time you reach out. So, but if they see that you've been at some meetup, they see that you've been at a thing, they see that you've been like, you know, and this isn't for, for a client, this is for community stuff. They see you kind of around, they trust you, right? Because what happens is lots of people are coming into the space and lots of people want the benefit of having the relationships. And so they start asking for stuff and they start trying to get stuff really quickly um, without kind of giving value. But what happens is the people that, you know, have the most value, they're looking to share that and they start becoming a little protective about who they share that with as it grows because more and more bad actors enter trying to like siphon some of that skill and siphon some of that access. And so as this thing grows, as more and more people enter this space, it may not be as easy as it is now to get access to some of the top performers, some of the top designers, some of the top developers, some of the top agencies. And so now is really the time to be putting in the work, building the relationships, doing streams, you know, uh, doing content, building educational stuff, like finding ways to get involved because two, three, four, or five years from now, and I know this from experience, seeing the WordPress community just kind of explode uh, over the last decade, you know, going back to, you know, I started doing WordPress meetups back in 2012 or 13. Um, and so seeing some of this stuff come before, knowing what's coming next as this market expands, and it's not just Webflow. There's lots of things building and growing and lots of tools and lots of people trying to get into this creative space and make money online and become a freelancer. And so it's going to become interesting to see how all of these networks kind of connect. Uh, how do these worlds overlap? Um, I'd be interested. Anybody else in the chat here uh, have thoughts from the Twitter side? I know, Zach, uh, you're up here and haven't had a chance to speak. Uh, Dustin's still up there. Anybody else, feel free to jump in, raise your hand. Otherwise, you know, I'll just continue rambling because that's I'm good at that. <laughs> hey, what's up? What's up, Zach? <laughs> hey, um... I think I can add a little bit to the conversation about niche because in a way I, I feel like niche is kind of my niche and uh, kind of building that, you know, like it's so important to, um, you know, show off who you've worked with within your own niche and, and you can get a lot of referrals and a lot of trust and word of mouth, just um, taking on kind of the right projects, showing them off to people and that trust that, that people within that niche will have knowing that you've worked with, you know, one of their competitors or someone that's top in the industry is, is one of the best sales tools you could ever have. So starting out, you know, one easy way, if you're getting into a new niche that you want to work with is just identify, make a list in Airtable of all the potential uh, businesses or websites out there, you know, put their name, their, their URL, put, uh, a ranking of how good their website is now, if it's good or if it's trash. And, um, you know, just kind of work your way down the list and, and try to find someone that needs your help in that industry. That's important. And just make it happen for that person because you'll, if you make, if you uh, can transform their site and show that off to people and say, yeah, I worked with, with so-and-so, you know, it's like having, you know, a salesperson with you all the time in that industry. And, um, you know, you can, if you work with the big fish, all the little fish would want to work with you too, just to kind of add into that fishing analogy there. Yeah. That reminds me of a story of, um, 80, 20, uh, Matt Bar Vargasy. I don't, I don't, I never remember how to say his last name. Sorry, Matt, if you're listening. Um, <laughs> But he did a website for a, a hip hop artist like that, where he just kind of created the website and then reached out and was like, hey, I really want to work with you. Here's this site. If you like it, you can keep it. Let's talk. Um, and that's a yeah. way if you're going to do cold outreach, like that's the fucking like ball or way to do it. Right. Like you can in, in, in your Airtable list, add what their influence is. 
and if it's a if it's someone that has a lot of influence in that niche you know that and they have a terrible website that should be the first person you go after yeah kevin on youtube is saying i'm taking this approach with chris sharma rock climber inspired by matt's email to hassan minaj is what it was great thanks for the the reference and clarity there yeah, Kevin, uh, if you can join us on Twitter by any chance, I'd love to get you into the space talking about that. Um, Zach, super good advice. Um, Zach is, uh, you know, building a little monster, speaking of niches, inside the medical space. And so that's good advice from Zach um, to just kind of whittle it down, identify those early possible opportunities in your niche. And then I think, um, you know, like find creative ways to target and reach out to them because I don't think I would consider that like a cold outreach specifically. Um, I see nice Kevin jumped in on Twitter. Going to prove that. Um, so I think that's one of those things where it's like, maybe it's cold outreach, but maybe it's something else because it's so targeted when you do something like that, like what Kevin's talking about, what Matt is uh, talking about. Kevin, feel free to jump in here and, and share your thoughts, but I'm not sure that's specifically like cold outreach. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. Aiva, Aiva saying kind of like warm outreach. Um, Zach, any any thoughts here? Actually, let's let's let Kevin jump in. Go ahead, Kevin. Hey, Rayma. Um, yeah, so I I'm you know I've been looking for ways to kind of like test my my webflow skills and try new tricks that I see on YouTube videos and things like that. So I just figured finding a a site to build using some of that inspiration would be a, a cool way to actually put that to test and maybe get something out of it, right? I know it's a little selfish to make a site for free for someone, but I wanna, you know, I wanna use his name as uh, on my portfolio as well and say, yeah, I made the website for Chris Sharma. So in the YouTube chat, I posted a, a couple of links if you wanted to check it out, but his website right now is nothing special. And I just watched his uh, show on HBO called The Climb. And I'm sure like most of you, you just go see, does this person even have a website? If not, maybe they need a website. So I checked out his website. It wasn't anything special and thought I could do a little better with uh, some of the inspiration from uh, the amazing content creators on, on YouTube that we've got here. Yeah. I think that's such a good, it's such a underrated like hack and worst case scenario, you probably get like a dope portfolio site or something cool to show off in your website. And this is where I think like, if you're going to put some time into doing something free, at least make it as high a likelihood of success for that time as possible, which means like, do something beautiful, pick a big brand, pick a big nonprofit, like take your shot at some kind of celebrity. Um, Zach, I, I see you uh, coming off mute. You got thoughts on that? Uh, yeah. No, and, and I was just going to add to it that, you know, don't underestimate if you're doing a niche and uh, don't un underestimate having a small text link or something in the footer of, of your, your uh, site, your portfolio, because a lot of people, uh, in your niche, they're not going to be searching out, you know, whatever your niche is, uh, web flow design. They're not going to be looking for that, but they're, they will be on their competitor sites pretty often, especially when their competitor says they launched a new site. Everyone wants to check it out. They'll scroll to the bottom to just kind of see who made it. And, you know, they want to, you, you also get a backlink for it for SEO. I mean, it's just that little thing that you can do and just start getting your name at the bottom of, of all your niche websites. And, a lot of people are totally fine to have that on their site, you know, depending on the industry, but, um, you know, super valuable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. Kevin, any, uh, any follow-ups there? Just the, uh, the biggest challenge I've had since I made the site for Chris Sharma is just getting his attention. I've messaged him on a couple of different social media platforms that he's on. His website has like a contact form, but doesn't list a clear email address. So, uh, it was over a week ago that I, I reached out and I will be very transparent that I used um, that Matt Varhees email text almost verbatim, but a little little more on my own there, but just kind of saying, hey, if that worked for him, maybe maybe that works for me to grab some attention. But as a, you know, as a celebrity that he is, quote unquote, I don't know the right way to grab his attention for this. Let's see if we can find that on. Uh, let's see if I can. So I put a link in the chat, in which chat? of some of the YouTube chat, um, which was a recap tweet from Matt. It's right there, Rima. That first one there with that picture with yeah. the, the white body text there. 
Nice. Um, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. So hell of a week for LA and LA for the premiere of Hassan Minaj, the King's Jester. If you told me that at what flow, no code and a cold email would have changed my life so drastically this year, got me credit in a Netflix special, I wouldn't have believed you. And so he is here. He is with the crew, uh, you know, showing them on stage here. And then, hey, Hassan, I'll keep it brief. I built you a new website. If you like it, keep it. No strings attached. I'd love to find a way to work together eventually if you're up for it. Um, and so, yeah, creative consultants. There you go, Matt Bar Barzi. Um, and so that's it's just a cool story of, you know, cold again, cold outreach. I think this still qualifies as cold outreach because you don't know them. Even though you've built something like this and it's something interesting for them to have and it's something to warm up your cold outreach, I don't know if this considers warm outreach. What I consider warm outreach is somebody who's made a referral or who's introduced the conversation. Um, I don't know. Any, anybody have disagreeing thoughts with that? I don't know that I would say disagreeing. I would say maybe another layer to add in is I've seen other people just talking about kind of manifesting and talking publicly about the types of clients that they want to work with. So they don't necessarily name. And I think that, that probably works on a couple different levels. One, it's, it's putting it in your own mind about where it is that you're going. So that, that video from Dan Petty earlier of, you know, making sure that you're talking and showing the things that you want to do, you know, you're kind of internalizing that, but you're also sort of putting it out there for others to see, plant that seed in other folks' mind. And if they hear of someone looking for something, you may then become top of mind and you may then have a referral yeah. as a result. And honestly, here I would add like also best projects I had were landed the same way. Like you work for free, you send it out, you say, hey, you guys are looking for somebody. Here's an example specifically for you. Like I already did it. I spent like three hours or, or, or three days, whatever it is, like depends a little bit on the project. And then those clients, if they land, they usually are best clients ever. Because if they don't land, they, they won't land anyway. Like they will not happen no matter how. But but when they do, you usually show up at the right time in the right spot. And also as like you have a portfolio piece or something, uh, something that you own up until they say yes. And then you start working with them. And then it's usually it's a long lasting relationship because for them, it's like a pleasure of somebody spent all that time getting into my unique problem and solving it without me even knowing that's a next level kind of touch point that you cannot reproduce anyway, like any other way. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's, um, that's also come up. We've done streams like this in the past, um, in various ways. And that comes up pretty regularly. It's deliver as much value as possible before you get the client, you know, before you land the client, you know, this is a good way to land that initial client is deliver as much value as possible, especially in those early stages of your career where maybe you don't have the work. Once you have a portfolio like a Grace Walker, then the clients come to you and you're in control. You know, like this is it changes. We're talking about your first clients. And so some of these strategies may change as you evolve from learning how to fish to, you know, like being a sports fisherman doing deep sea fishing every day. Right. And so going back to our analogy through the show, like you may have to early on find ways to reach these customers, especially when you want to jump a gap. Right. If you want to go to, hey, I just do these typical websites usually. And now I want to take this exponential jump into a new stratosphere. You have to show how your work can kind of validate that tier step. Right. And that's either doing something beautiful in a clonable or doing some kind of demo site or doing some kind of skill. I saw something the other day. It was like a full animated video that this person had just created for shits and giggles. And it was like amazing. And I'm like, what? Like, hire this guy. Right. And so I got to imagine that video, like it went viral, it was going nuts. It was like a, like a, I don't want to, anyway. Um, but I got to imagine that's like a beautiful way to get noticed. Right. Um, when I first started playing in this space, I made a website called Hire Me, you know, uh, and it was like the top 10 reasons why Webflow should hire me. I got an interview with Vlad for the head of community position, right? Like my resume may not have qualified me for that position, but creating the Webflow site got me on the radar enough for people to like take me seriously in that role. 
And so as you're thinking about how do you attract clients and how do you kind of like take this next step, those are beautiful mechanisms to potentially do those things. So yeah, shout out to whoever started that idea. <laughs> Deliver as much value as possible before landing the client. And yeah, I think that was er ahead. earlier, one of the, our first person from Twitter spaces. Yeah. Was talking about that. Right, right. Uh, and Fitter Media is saying the more personal, the better when it comes to cold outreach. So for sure, anything you can do to warm that cold outreach up is the is the ideal mechanism there. So um, also also in this scenario, be prepared for disappointment. But yeah, sure. Freelancer job is to be halfway always disappointed, right? So it's sad when you spend like hours or even days preparing something and then nobody replies. I think that's the worst when they deprive with a no, at least it's like, oh, OK. And here it's as, as, as like uh, somebody already mentioned, hard to find, hard to get, maybe they don't reply, but still that's like the, the fisherman job, right? Yeah. <laughs> because. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, again, it's one of those things where you just got to have as many at bats as you can get, you know, you just got to put the opportunities out there. You'll get better at, you know, like you just got to have the bait in the water. Um, and there's all sorts of analogies. I used to talk about like why content is important because content's like baiting the hook. And so the more hooks you have out there, the more opportunities you have to like catch those fish and at least get bites that you can maybe reel in, you know, because a lot of times just because you they took a bite doesn't mean you're going to like catch the fish. A lot of times like the hook comes off and the fish swims away or for whatever reason, the line snaps or whatever. Right? There's lots of reasons. Um, but yeah, the more opportunities you have, the more times you can kind of get into these reps, the better you're going to get at figuring out what is it these clients want. Um, and I'm kind of thinking it'd be interesting to do a series about selling into like, um, like high value accounts outside of US territory, like how to sell into the US market from the outside. Because mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of people, um, especially coming off my most recent trip to Argentina and, and working with some of the folks in, in Buenos Aires that are just looking to get some of those, you know, opportunities. And I think they're available to all of us. You know, they're available to everyone that's got access to the internet right now. And so just finding ways to kind of elevate yourself, find new ways to land clients, build exposure, et cetera. That's what you're going to see us kind of shift the focus of some of this, especially as we go into the open house. Um, I think we're going to wind down the conversation. Any final thoughts from anybody on the Twitter that's still got uh, speaker role? I think that's only Zach. And then we'll, um, uh, Throw it around to Aiva and Colleen for final thoughts. Going once, going twice. All right, Colleen um, or Aiva for final thoughts. I'm liking this format. I'm liking the the note taking. I mean, this has been, a, I think, a great experiment with pulling in Twitter spaces. We've got the pulling in with the green room for YouTube, taking the notes. Um, I think we should maybe think afterwards a little bit about how to repackage and how to take this maybe to the next level. And, you know, do we continue any of this as part of a breakout in some form at the Global Open House? Yeah, I, I loved this format. I want to do more of this. I want to do more just off the cuff, get a topic, get a couple people around the, the, the table and facilitate the conversation. I think this would have been cool as a Figma board. So mm -hmm. people could jump in and add notes and leave thoughts that are maybe not. So it's like you can jump in audio, you can jump in video. That's you know in the in the in the you know backstage if you want to get on the call and we can fit up to five people. So maybe it's like the first five people that jump in get on the left side here. We've got the group that we can bring in visually, and then I love the the Twitter Space Live. I think that's going to become a staple, like having the ability for people to just jump in real easily and and share their thoughts with voice. There's like there's just no real risk there, you know, for people to jump in rather than like, you know, putting their, their camera on. <laughs> yeah. This, this felt, this felt what we, what you were, I think, thriving from day one and it's super awesome. Uh, and as Colleen said, I agree, like a little bit of tiny repackaging comes because I think technically it's reached the, the whole attitude towards a live show. Zach's microphone on, on, on Twitter spaces added that calling in on the landline vibe. Like I love this whole, the way it went, like it's super awesome. So super excited to be kind of seeing that this hard thing came into fruition. Yeah. Go ahead, Zach. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm in my car. So I was dropping off my kid at school and then I just went to Best Buy to pick up a new Wacom tablet. So it's about as raw as it gets. 
Love it. Well, we were, what we we're going for is like that, like that radio morning, you know, talk show. I also think like this would be fun to do almost just like to have a live lobby that is like doing like a daily, you know, like the end of the day, happy hour, hang out. I don't know. Um, expect us to keep, oh. expect us to experiment with this type of format regularly. Honestly, I think this is, this is, this is going to be cool because you can add context here. So it's like the audio, but also if you want more layers, you can go into the video. If you want to get involved, the YouTube chat is live and we can literally bring the YouTube chat like live on the screen here. So people can kind of go through the chat. And as I, you know, click on the chat, it brings it up on screen. So literally we can then highlight different things on screen as we go here. Um, this as a phone can be literally anything. So we can have a podcast in here. We can have Twitter on here, you know, like, so this literally my phone. Uh, the only thing I'm worried about is notifications popping up, but it might be fun to even just come through here and see like what's happening on the Twitterverse. You know, y'all looking down my uh, Twitter screen now. Maybe that's not the best idea, huh? So <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I like the idea of just getting interactive, having playful conversations, exploring the web. You know, we could be watching a YouTube video right now. We could be watching kind of anything that is well, going we, on in the world. Go ahead, Colleen. Yeah, I was going to say, we started with, with, with bouncing in on Hillary with the Salon de Refuse says if i'm pronouncing that right i don't speak french um but that was that was fun to see what else is going on elsewhere yeah imagine like webflow is doing their live and we're like literally watching live over top of the live but joking around and being silly and i don't know <laughs> it could be fun and the figma figma idea from colleen i don't know if you guys saw like my thursday videos but that's like where the meme game will become aggressive so don't let me in there because then it's just gonna be <laughs> Oh, just constant flow. just posting memes inside the <laughs> yeah, Figma in board. Figma, it's so easy. Just copy paste bomb it. <laughs> I think that could be a lot of fun. My, if you know anything about me, my whole mission is like figuring out how do we use these tools creatively, from a multimedia standpoint, to kind of like rejigger the incentives in how we do this stuff online. Which I imagine means we're gonna just be kind of goofing around for a while in not very like well trafficked experiences. So like right now, eleven people on Twitter Spaces. There's twelve people on uh, YouTube. We've had total sixty views, but the average view duration is almost twenty minutes, which is great. So I don't I don't know what's happening here. I don't have any intention that this is gonna be like the next viral sensation, you know, but. Uh, I think if we keep doing this, we can we can come up with something cool, some cool way to get people involved in the process of hanging with us and sharing their work on a consistent basis. And like maybe we can use this platform, which is the goal to elevate other folks in the space, which is kind of what we're trying to do is build a platform that other folks can stand on to land more clients, to do all the things we talked about today. So anyway, stay tuned as we continue to experiment with all of that. And um, yeah, any any final thoughts, Colleen? No, I'm just excited that we did it. So thanks everyone for coming and I'm looking forward to continuing to experiment and iterate. If you're new to all of this, uh, sign up for the mailing list to know when we go live. Um, there's also the sub subscribe button, but we may be doing some experiments that don't involve YouTube. So email is probably the best as part of stateoflow.io. And if you have feedback, let us know. Yeah. Um, and keep an eye out this uh, Reloom Design League that's going to be live in, in a, geez, it's only a couple hours right now. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. Lots coming. Um, I'm excited to experiment with all of this stuff. To be honest, I, I get giddy every time I think about, <laughs> I remember Colleen, that one of the first, like, do you remember one of the first streams we tried to do where I was like trying to bring zoom in over top and trying to do some of this stuff. And we like, it was so screwy, like it was so bad. <laughs> But anyway, but it's, here we are. We, we were talking early, uh, just a few moments ago about putting those hooks in the water, putting all those fish. You know, Iva, you were mentioning about all those no's. And it, some of it is sometimes having a vision. You don't necessarily have to have it fully clearly defined, but just something. And then just try it. It's not working. Don't take it as a total no. Maybe it is you don't quite have a skill set where a tech, piece of tech hasn't come into play or you haven't had that conversation with someone who's going to spark an idea that's going to open a door that's then going to let you get to that next thing. So, Or you yeah. haven't tried to solve an unrelated problem that will by accident just answer a problem mm -hmm. you didn't even know that 
you should research and i think that's what happens all the time like mm. you, if you keep learning it's mm -hmm. open questions you know knowing the question is the, the hardest part and then from there the more you have open the more you solve eventually and and as colleen says some of them are not meant to solve so or not now or not never maybe yeah. possibly yeah yeah but vision is good vision is good and i think this was the vision like today it felt like the vision jumping on somebody's live stream live from zach's car like so many things happened that was exactly the the, the idea the way i kind of understood it from day one it's so awesome yeah even just this uh this this concept here i think it was months ago aiva that i mentioned like we wanted to do this live experiment thing where we just kind of bring people in from both sides from all sides like just let's have fun with it so bitter media i agree this was fun rymar has all the toys when it comes to live streaming and production yes i had a friend the other day who was trying to like ask me how i was doing some of this stuff because they wanted to do it too and um they're trying to recreate it with like you know an emulator and this that the other and it was just like you just you're not going to be able to get away with some of this <laughs> by cheating it so uh if you're tuning in at this point for your finding your first com client conversation that's uh that has long evolved we're we're now just rambling about <laughs> the show and the process here so anyway we're gonna leave it at that thanks everyone for joining us whether you tuned in on twitter or youtube um we had a lot of fun experimenting with this and we'll continue to do so moving forward we will see you all. Uh, make sure you check out stateoflow.io for all the events that are coming up. Uh, you can have direct links to basically all these videos. Colleen does such a good job of curating this stuff, and it's up there for your convenience every week. So go give that a, uh, a look and drop your email in there because we got lots more stuff coming up. So, all right, with that, I'm going to do the exit music. We'll give this thing a little hit, bring it up real slow. <laughs> I still don't have my little, like, what I'm supposed to, like, cut away to. <laughs> I just need a video, right? Like, just a fade to black or something, right? A future week. One of these a future days. week. One of these days. One of these days. One percent better every week. <laughs> oh, there you go. We can see this screen. That was not the right one. Okay. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right.